Thank you, Asia. So in this closing plenary, we want to connect the discussions we've been having here at the summit over the past three days with what comes next. So we have invited three leaders in the digital innovation space to share how their organizations are thinking about and planning for the coming decade and the role of digital innovation. And it is my pleasure to welcome to the NetHope Summit stage, Nena Vakama, Chief Web Advocate at the World Wide Web Foundation, joining us from West Africa. Robert Opp, Chief Digital Officer at UNDP, joining us from New York. And Bernard Kovac, Head of Innovation Accelerator at the World Food Program, joining us from Munich. Welcome, Nena, Robert, and Bernard, and thank you for joining us today. Now, this discussion will focus on digital innovation. Why it matters? What are some of the most promising digital innovations for the coming decade? What are the risks? And how do we deliver digital innovation to meet the needs today and the challenges ahead? It's worth repeating what's been said many times at this summit. At NetHope, we believe that every organization today is a digital organization. And we don't see innovation as synonymous with technology only. It's also very much about people and process. And that's what we'll talk about today. And we couldn't possibly talk about future without anchoring it in the present, which means acknowledging the unprecedented challenges and problems that we face today. And just to create a backdrop for this discussion, I'll share with you um, some of the challenges and problems that came up at the summit over the past three days. First, extreme poverty is on the rise for the first time in two decades. Inequality is deeply entrenched. Just earlier this week, Doreen Bogdan Martin, the Secretary General of the ITU said that one third of humanity has never been online. A majority are women and girls. Violent conflict is currently at a 30 year high and the record of 100 million people have been forcibly displaced worldwide. And fundamental rights, human rights are at risk in every part of the world. What's more, climate change is only exacerbating and amplifying many of these problems. It is a threat multiplier that has exposed nearly a third of humanity to grave risks and could lead to 50% increase in the number of people needing international aid in the coming decade. So I think the case for digital has never been more urgent and more clear. And I'd like to start by asking each one of our speakers to talk about how your organizations are approaching digital innovation in the face of these unprecedented and compounded emergencies and problems. Robert, first to you, and then Nina and Bernard. Thanks, Leila, and it's a pleasure to be here uh, with you. Um, I think you know one of the, you mentioned a lot of the kind of sources of uncertainty in the world right now. Um, some of the things that have also contributed to where we are right now was, is the COVID pandemic, of course, which has also led to a reverse in human development gains uh, for the first time since the Human Development Index was created in 1990. Um, so that is another element that has been facing uh, countries and organizations around the world. And UNDP has really looked at this as a kind of um, uh, digital as an enabler for development. Um, and of course, that was present before the COVID pandemic, but it has accelerated since the pandemic as well. Um, and the countries that we serve, and we're present in 170 countries worldwide, um, immediately after the COVID pandemic emerged, we started to see the amount of demand that was out there for digital innovation. Um, and we started to respond to that. So we were lucky in that we had already launched a digital transformation in the organization just prior to the, the pandemic coming on the scene. Um, but we very much had to accelerate our efforts in order to serve our partners. And some of the things that we've really seen are necessary is um, support in individual solutions. So countries are asking for digital solutions for how do I kind of maintain my health system online? How do I put education online? And all of those things that we've all been dealing with. But we also saw requests for things like um, what kind of policies and legal frameworks do I need to have in place in order to um, ensure data privacy of citizens or um, to ensure that I'm, I'm governing technologies um, appropriately? 
Um, and then also requests around how do we, as a, as a country, think of our own digital transformation. And so UNDP is getting a lot of those kinds of requests as well and supporting countries as they work to build their digital infrastructures out. Um, so it's kind of been an interesting shift to see that you and UNDP has kind of shifted along with it, kind of moving from just a space of solutions, which are still valid and important, but thinking about systems and ecosystems of support for digital, um, as well as kind of really trying to deal with some of the fragmentation issues and moving to more strategic approaches. But I'll, I'll leave it there for now. Thanks. Yeah, thank you, Robert. And we'll come back to the um, this topic of digital transformation in the context of actually systems and ecosystems rather than individual solutions. Um, now over to Nana to just understand how the World Wide Web Foundation is uh, thinking about digital innovation, given the challenges today, and then um, just given the problems that we might be facing in the future. Hello, everyone. And uh, thank you, Leila, for having me. And congratulations for having stayed through uh, till the third day. Uh, it's been a wonderful three days. Uh, so we're talking on one hand, digital, on, on the other hand, innovation. And at the center is myself, that is humans, right? So digital innovation with Nina at the center. And if you're looking at my face, you can see um, I'm a black African woman and I'm in West Africa. So we're looking at digital innovation and I'm looking at people like myself, or people who are not in the majority, people who are in the le uh, least advanced economies, people who are, who are in the less connected environments. And um, one of the things that Robert raised is uh, the, well, sorry, Leila raised earlier was uh, Doreen Bogdan Martin of ITU. By the way, it took ITU 157 years to elect a woman as secretary general. Let me just say this while I'm here. But then the, the explanation of being online is connecting once in three months. And that cannot be what we keep us today. After the pan, I mean, in the heat of the pandemic, we all ask people to work online, to school online, to do many things online, but where are they ready for it. I believe that the post-pandemic era has taught us that first of all, we actually should leave no one behind. So if we're looking at innovation, I think that we're looking at innovation in connectivity, in ensuring that people are connected. I, um, I may speak later about some uh, initiatives, but the one thing about innovation will be in connectivity daily meaningful connectivity. That is my first point. My second point is in making it reach the very last of people. Because when, when all of us were under the pandemic, we knew that your health depended on my health. So first connect everyone and then everybody's responsibility. Because you could be vaccinated. If I choose not to, then you are still in danger. So one thing, connect us. Second thing, connect everyone. And third thing, responsibility of everyone. So digital innovation will also ensure that all of us are digitally responsible. I'll stop there for now. Great, thanks so much, Nina. And thank you also for highlighting the importance of just um, universal connectivity. And you are absolutely right. This is something that's been top of mind for the NetHub community for the past 20 years. And um, we'll also come back to this question around what happens, what is meaningful connectivity, and then what happens once you're actually online. Um, Bernard, um, at the WSB at the Innovation Accelerator, how are you thinking about digital innovation, given actually some of the problems that you are tackling today and obviously the future? Yeah, and let me start with uh, the picture of the World Food Program globally, which is, of course, what you were mentioning earlier about the drastic numbers that we've seen in rising poverty rates across the globe. We're seeing the same when you look at hunger and acute hunger in particular. So there's now, right now, 345 million acutely hungry people on the planet so like people marching towards starvation which is more than double of that number of, since 2019 and th this is really really drastic and something that we should all be concerned about now we as world food program are active in 
both emergency response, but also sustainably ending hunger. So saving lives in emergencies, but also changing lives more sustainably. And what you're seeing in all the work that we're doing is actually engaging in both of those areas. Um, so for instance, now when you're, it's because you were asking like, how are we tackling that? So one part, and it's the uh, first element of this is actually how we integrated this in the World Food Program strategic plan. When you look at the strategic plan of the World Food Program right now, if it's like a four year plan until 2025, um, it has strategic outcome pillars. Uh, such as you know saving lives in emergencies, but like uh, but also it has underpinning enablers. One of them is technology. One of them is innovation, alongside with people and other things that we, that we're looking at. Um, and it is very interesting because uh, as an organization we have embraced uh, digital transformation. So you'll see there, for instance, like across the value chain of what we're doing to be uh, data driven, to be actually a digital enabled organization throughout all the processes of the organization is core of what the organization has embarked on. So that's in the digital transformation space. And now in innovation, we really believe that it's not just everywhere in the organization. So you look at the World Food Programs field offices, and we are active in 120 countries and territories. So is the, it's those people, you know, serving people in the, on the front lines that need to be innovative, uh, and that's something that should be underpinned through innovations in programs, uh, innovations in business processes, as you were saying. And then we also have a support infrastructure, and this is what I'm leading. I'm leading our global what's called the Innovation Accelerator. Uh, uh, that actually supports innovators, you know, inside the organization, but also external startups and NGOs to bring together the best ideas and the best minds uh, with, you know, the people from the World Food Program who know the problems of the people on the ground who, who, and who work with them day, day by day, every, you know, throughout the year. And I think this is one of the elements of not to forget, like, so even if you have policy, you also ideally have some sort of support infrastructure to support those digital innovations, whether that's through, you know, incentive competitions, or in our case, it's also through a dedicated what we call innovation accelerator. Yeah, thank you for adding that. So just a couple of things that came up here that we'll, we'll try to explore a bit later in the conversation, digital transformation, systems change, meaningful and responsible connectivity and digital inclusion, and then this concept of innovation ecosystem. Um, I wanna come back actually to the digital transformation question. And um, Robert, you mentioned it too. The reality is that much of our sector isn't adequately equipped for the digital age. And the process of digital transformation is painfully slow. With these crises escalating, the pressure to accelerate digital transformation is mounting. What specific actions, if you can maybe recommend two or three, um, would you recommend taking to accelerate digital transformation so we can both tackle the, these tremendous problems and, and meet the needs today, but also prepare for the future? Yeah, um, well, I mean, this is a great question because um, we face this problem inside our organizations, but we also face this problem uh, as the partners to our, our, our host countries. Um, so if I can speak just a little bit to, to that, um, internally, uh, what UNDP has done is, as I said before, launched a, a corporate-wide digital transformation, and that has various elements to it including changing and building a digital culture in the organization, which is really about changing a mindset um, more than anything, because digital transformation uh, as and same as innovation is really about people at the end of the day when you talk about our organizations. Um, so building out digital culture, um, really start uh, looking at how we can scale innovations, because we see many digital innovations that come up at the country level, but then what do they do beyond the country borders? And so putting in place things like a scaling accelerator, um, which is able to match external firms with different kinds of technologies and approaches with our country offices and their particular challenges and so on. Um, and so there are many things internally, we're really pushing the organization with a digital strategy that, that you can find online that is really about taking the organization in a journey so that we end up being capacitated fully in digital so that we're able to support our partners. But in the meantime, that support to partners doesn't uh, let up. Um, and so we need to be responding to the, the, the needs of our partner countries. Um, and when you look at accelerating digital transformation in countries at a, at a national or a societal level, 
um, there are some things that we're really uh, looking at carefully. And of course, one of them is making sure that countries are given advice and, and support with best practices from around the world on how to do digital transformation. Um, but in very importantly, and this is what Nena was, was mentioning, um, why do we do this? Well, we're not doing this just to kind of empower a middle class in these countries that already have access to smartphones. What we need to do is to put inclusion and gender sensitive approaches at the center of what we do in digital transformation. Um, and so this is the, the key to that, um, so that every policy, every technology step is thought of with these things, people at the center and leaving no one behind. So reaching the last person in societies. Um, and to that, we, we see, uh, for, for example, we see a lot of potential in things like digital public infrastructure created with uh, open source solutions and architectures and things like that that can be reused in different countries. So taking kind of not just the best practices, but the actual architectures developed by countries like India, Bangladesh, uh, Rwanda, et cetera, and making them available to other countries. Um, that's a way of accelerating. And then also ensuring that the capacities and the ecosystems are in place in those countries to really support the usage and full productivity of connectivity. So. I, I've said a lot, maybe I'll stop there for now, but that's, that's we really see a lot of hope to uh, accelerate digital with that with those kinds of means. Now, thank you so much for um, outlining some of these digital imperatives for pretty much every organization and sector, because you're mentioning digital culture, you're mentioning capacity, um, making sure that your ecosystem is thriving, and that also very much this concept of putting inclusion at the center. And with that, I wanna come back to something that um, Nena, you talked about, connectivity being um, a barrier to solving many of the problems that we face today. And touch on one of the things that's been discussed at the summit this week, which is um, how we bring people online matters, given uh, the risks that they will face online, such as misinformation, disinformation, fake news, um, harassment, hate speech, and other harms. Nina, what needs to be done to keep people safe online? Okay, so here is the thing. As humans today, if you don't have a digital identity, it appears you are not existent. So it is really very important that we do, that we look at this as existential. Now, when you come online and you are not safe and secure, so you are an endangered species, which is like most of us. I introduce myself as Nenna from the internet is because I work, I bank, I do a lot of things online. You most certainly have heard about the Alliance for Affordable Internet. You may be hearing very soon about the Global Digital Inclusion Partnership because it is very important that when we come online, so when you are born, you need to, to be educated. So we get people online, we grow them online, we ensure that they are safe and secure. And that means that first of all, they themselves are digitally literate because you have to be self-aware as an individual and as a digital citizen. So that digital literacy has come across. We have been consulting uh, when we have national uh, round tables, when we go down, people like, we don't know how to do this. That's why we're making this mistake. So for people to be secure online, digital literacy is very important. Know how it works know how you take care of yourself, digital hygiene, ethics, all those things. You can only require responsibility from someone who is aware of their responsibilities. So digital literacy is not just knowing how it works, but also being digitally aware of what your role and your responsibility is as a digital citizen. So the first thing is digital literacy. The second is institutional, uh, if, if you want policy, like, like Robert has said, governments are asking themselves, how do we do this the best? And I will say multi-stakeholder engagement. This is really very important. No one person can solve digital innovation issues because you 
you can give me something, but if I don't know how to use it, if I don't know how to use it responsibly. And um, in our work at the World Wide Web Foundation, we have gone to platforms, companies, and they have taken commitments to ensure, uh, to, to do better. There is no 100% security, but they are doing their best. So individuals need to be educated, Governments need to adopt the right policies. Uh, industry needs to engage and commit to use tech tools uh, to bring down um, insecurity and make people feel uh, welcome online. One thing, though, that I have to say, please don't laugh. Uh, when someone is being attacked online, like our, 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 our research shows, Online gender-based violence has as its two main targets, women who are in the public sphere, that means women in politics, and women who are in, in journalism. So women in journalism, women in public sphere, or women in politics are highly attacked online. And what this has as effect is that these women tend to disconnect. So on one hand, we're trying to connect the unconnected, and on the other hand, insecurity is disconnecting they connected. And if you look at these two women, sorry, women in politics, women in journalism, these are women who need to bring voices and change. And so if you're attacking these people, you're actually attacking the future of humanity. And I believe that we need not just policies, but we need to prosecute people. And we need these women to be given the capacity to, uh, to, uh, to go to court, sue people, and get redressed. So in, in uh, I will wrap it up by saying, yes, literacy, yes, policy, yes, responsibility, but also prosecution and litigation capacities. Thank you, Nana, and thank you also for summarizing um, so many um, really valuable points related to actually being safe online. Um, Bernard, um, just to shift gears, um, I want to come back to something that you talked about um, in your opening remarks. WFP declared this year, 2022, a year of unprecedented hunger, and much of it, as, as you mentioned, is due to conflict climate shocks and the economic consequences of the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, which has resulted in over 800 million people going to bed hungry each night. At the WFP Accelerator, Innovation Accelerator, you have the mission to reach zero hunger by leveraging digital technology. Well, could you share what you are seeing as some of the most promising digital technologies that can help us solve the challenges like food insecurity and hunger? Yeah, look, Leila, it, it's one of those um, times, I guess, in, in history, like it's what from what you were mentioning, what compounds those issues even is like uh, food inflation and uh, fuel inflation on top of everything that you just mentioned, which then leads to these uh, facts that, you know, people who are the most vulnerable, they are hit hard yet another time. Um, and so what we are looking into at the World Food Problem Innovation Accelerator is we're trying to look into like these areas that I've mentioned, like, you know, emergency response, but also sustainably ending hunger and like, where can we make the biggest contributions through you know new business process new business models working with private sector but also the uh, digital technologies new technology solution that can actually help us do this um and i'll i'll, I'll mention two examples like one and this is uh, around the area of cash transfers Cash transfers about 10 years ago had, were only 2% of the World Food Programs assistance portfolio. Right now, it's actually 34%. So it has increased, like, it's a good example of like, can innovations or things that are new to the organization scale? Yes, they can. So last year, this was already $2.3 billion of the uh, transfers. So people can go into stores and purchase food. Um, and this is one of the areas, of course, where we're looking into different innovation areas, be it for financial inclusion, specifically financial inclusion for um, gender empower female empowerment, but then also how can we use technologies to serve vulnerable populations and like most recently this might even be uh, cryptocurrencies uh, or using Web3 or blockchain wallets. So like as a good example as a building blocks, which is one of the blockchain wallets we're using actually for better collaboration across UN entities and NGOs to transfer money to vulnerable populations and they can go shopping. And this 
being used by over a million people and transferred over $400 million already. So it goes to show like you can actually use this for scale. Another example, and like I, I want to say, is actually coming back to like the underpinning of for a lot of innovation is actually internet or mobile technology. Um, and uh, then, you know, you can sometimes now see already there's artificial intelligence that's like kind of a little bit like the icing on the cake, but then it's also yet unlocking another layer of value for the people we are serving. Um, and so we've supported an innovation internally of the World Food Program that's called PLUS. It's a school meals optimizer app. And what it does, the person locally deciding on the school meal menu, they have um, it's uh, uh, an AI tool essentially in their hands where they can optimize the menu based on what's the cost of the of the goods, what's the lead time, what's the nutritious value, and it's optimizing this. Um, and like in the pilot implementation we did in the Dominican Republic with over 1.2 million children, we we're able to lower the cost by 15%, have a higher nutritious value for the children. At the same time, increase uh, the purchase from local farmers by 60%. And this is really when you go to then look into like, how is that possible? Well, it's a combination of data, uh, artificial intelligence, and the person who's actually deciding locally who has the knowledge now has that the power of this in their hands. And I think this is what really makes me also excited about there is solution that can really help make us that step change. Yeah, Bernard, thanks so much for sharing actually not one, but two examples um, and specifically um, also focused on SDG two. Um, and speaking of SDGs, I just want to briefly highlight for every one of us that in the next seven years, one of the big things that we all need to deliver is the 2030 Sustainable Development Agenda. So 17 Sustainable Development Goals and 169 targets. A recent report stated that these cascading interlinked crises are putting this agenda in great danger. So Robert and Nana, just briefly, would love to hear from you. How do you think digital can help us deliver on the SDGs? Is there like one specific example of a promising digital technology for any of the SDGs you'd like to focus on? First to Robert and then Nana. That's a big question. And I think, you know, Bernard's done a great job of outlining a few specific examples, but uh, I would add, um, you know, maybe when I think of what the kind of greater uh, availability and let's say abundance of data can bring, um, all of these technologies that we've been talking about, um, uh, artificial intelligence, um, blockchain or distributed ledgers, they really function on data, um, especially AI. So we need to make sure we've got good, solid data. And I think um, one of the biggest levers we could use is to really make sure that we've got good data that is openly available to um, all players, basically, so that if there are people in local digital ecosystems that want to build AI systems, they don't have to do that by assembling their own data sets. They can, they can access other data and things like that. Um, so that's one big piece. Uh, but we also see, you know, um, tremendous uh, potential in technologies um, like, you know, IoT, which is feeding data into, uh, you know, you can take IoT data and satellite imagery data and use it for uh, forest conservation, like we're doing in a number of places. Um, satellite imagery and AI models together can help target poverty, which we're doing in Bangladesh. Um, and then technologies like blockchain, Bernard was mentioning, but, you know, all of the kind of uh, traceability of supply chain elements of really um, being able to trace provenance of commodities. And so we're doing that with cashmere wool in Mongolia, um, cocoa in Ecuador, argan oil in Morocco. I mean, I could go on, but um, many interesting examples, tremendous examples of what can be done. Yeah, many interesting examples. And I think also one of the things that you highlight is that many of these technologies are data-driven technologies. So it's really important to get your data in order. Nana, over to you for um, an example or two. So we are here on digital and innovation. Let's not forget again. And that's why we've spent three days here, right? On digital, I will pinpoint community networks. It's a very simple technology that connects people locally and 
it's good for people like myself who live in Africa. So on the on the on the uh, innovation side, it's not huge technology. It's not uh, very big, but it has humans at the center. So community networks, community technology, these are uh, connectivity controlled and managed by communities. Uh, they are nonprofit and they help. Um, that's that's one thing that I want to see more of. The second one is a feminist global digital compact. I'll take that again. Feminist global digital compact. In the framework of our common agenda, um, it is foreseen that we will adopt uh, a global digital compact, which is a set of uh, uh, engagements. Uh, as, as human and humanity to help us advance on the on key priorities like connectivity, um, misleading content online, AI, um, and human rights online. It's seven of those. Internet frag fighting against internet fragmentation. These are these are key, and I, I applaud the work that the UN Tech Envoy is doing on that. Please uh, contribute if you have not done so. This is a huge community that we need to he hear your voices. So it is not enough for me for us to have a set of goals, a set of principles. No, it is enough for me that these set of principles are gender responsive. So that is why I'm saying a feminist global digital compact that recognizes that women are bearing the bigger brunt, that recognizes that less women are connected than men, that recognizes that women leadership is very important, that recognizes that women lead, digital literacy is key. So when we're talking about goal five, goal nine, this is it for me. So on one hand, community networks to, to co connect the very last people who need it, and on the other hand, in global digital cooperation, I want a feminist global digital compact. Don't forget, I'm here to fight for myself. People like me, that's why we are here. And I want digital hope. In other words, net hope. Wow, I love that, Nina. Digital hope, but also just this um, consistent thread that we've heard through this conversation, which is, inclusion, but also really looking from the perspectives of the different communities and what they need and making sure that they, the innovation, so in this case, we're discussing technology is designed from their perspective and for their use cases. Um, I want to just briefly touch on one thing just now that we've you know talked about some of some of the examples um, of how technology can serve people um, in just many powerful and um, important ways. We also know that technology comes with a number of risks and challenges. Some of them were highlighted through this conversation. Um, there are a number of examples that have been discussed at the summit of technology being used to intentionally or unintentionally exclude and disempower individuals and communities, erode human rights, as mentioned earlier in this conversation, and also undermine our institutions. So very briefly, in about 30 seconds, as we're uh, coming to a close, if you can just quickly mention what is the one risk that you're focusing on in your work and how are you addressing it? So I'll turn it over to Bernard, then Robert and Nena. So the, the, the biggest one is really like making sure that the solutions we're building is solving people's issues, like and leaving no one behind. I think that's one of the things that we really need to uh, keep in mind. And on the flip side, just to say something controversial is also, let's also think about the risk of not innovating or not actually putting digital innovations forward because that's sometimes forgotten where we're talking about everything that can go wrong when you're trying out something new, but you're never talking about something, you know, like, shouldn't that be the imperative that we're trying to serve people better? Yeah, I would say um, the for, for me, the biggest risk in all of this is a bit similar, but it's that we don't put people's rights, so human rights and inclusivity including gender inclusivity at the center of what we do so that when we implement technology, we have to put that at the center. And, the, and there's a huge risk, and we've seen many examples of it, in not doing that. You end up in the wrong place with digital transformation, with either technologies being used against people or people being left out and so on. Robert, for president, you spoke for us. Thank you very much. 
one thing that I'm, I'm, I'm worried about will be that governments would want to make policies just by themselves. And that's what we try to tackle with our tech policy design lab. We need all the stakeholders at the table. We need to co-create. We need to see together as, as humanity. So the multi-stakeholder uh, digital innovation is really something that I, I would like to put on the table. And if you forget every other thing I've said during Network Global Summit 2022, please remember that we are in this together, wherever we are, whatever the stake is, and we need to work together. Thank you, Nana. And I think, you know, again, throughout this discussion, all three of you have highlighted the importance of digital inclusion, multi-stakeholder collaboration, and importance, the imperative to actually innovate in order for us to solve some of these problems. Um, the other thing that has come up is some of the systems change work that needs to happen and the ecosystem approach. Um, on that note, I'd like to end also on a more positive note than where we started by actually um, getting anchored to some of the problems that we face today. And just briefly hear from each of you, what gives you the most optimism for the coming decade? Nana, let's go back to you and then uh, Robert and Bernard. I'm encouraged because after the pandemic, I no longer have to be the only one asking everyone to get connected. Everybody is now convinced. So I have made lots of um, converts in the connectivity journey. And when I say my name is Nena, I come from the internet. I have this optimism. I am sure that many have come online with me. And so if you're watching today, if you're following today, if you see me in 10 years time, remember that people fought for this. I'm encouraged that when you hear this, you will keep up the fight for everyone, to be online and to be a part of a global digital community. Yeah, I would say um, I, that's a great answer, Nina. Um, I would say, you know, we all know digital technologies are um, expanding in terms of their power at an exponential rate. That could mean that it, things get exponentially worse, but I believe things will actually get exponentially better if we can put things like human rights and people at the center of what we do. So that means it's a tremendous source of impact that we can have. Um, and if I can sneak a bonus one in, I would say that what excites me about what Nana said is that when we get those 2.7 billion minds online that are not currently, I think human genius will be able to also flow. So that, that excites me. Yes, from, from my side, what personally I, I find really exciting is that when we first started our journey as the World Food Program Innovation Accelerator, it seemed like a crazy idea that you actually use this type of like startup accelerator approach in helping some of the most vulnerable people across the world. And by, you know, since starting sev seven years ago, every single year, the projects and innovation we support have the impacted like the impact has doubled every single year by end of last year we've uh, in total impacted a total of nine million people already and they've raised a 180 million dollars of grant funding when you look across the portfolio of innovations and this gives me hope in some cases these innovations are even able to double the income uh, of people in developing countries that are smallholder farmers and like this is where you know we'll see a lot about like what is bad and what is you know not working but there is still hope if we find these great new innovations. Thank you. So I, I'd like to thank Nana, Robert and Bernard for joining us here today. We so appreciate your time, your expertise. Thank you for sharing some really important examples um, of the initiatives, of the projects, of the technologies, of the processes. And thank you also for your partnership.